heard it before and it's time to hear it again the answers to our problems comes from within well it's love the games of tomorrow they seem worse than before living a dead one repeat mr president sir uh, in the last minute i have that this debate is not whether civil rights should be extended to american negroes or not if it were, it would be a very easy motion to argue for and a very easy motion to vote for. The debate tonight uh, concerns whether the American dream is at the expense of the American Negro. That is, whether the American Negro has paid for the American dream with his suffering or whether the American dream has furthered Negro inequality. It is now with very great pleasure and a very great sense of honour that I call Mr. James Baldwin to speak third to this motion. Now we have Mr. James Baldwin, the star of the evening, who has been sitting, listening attentively, and getting a wonderful reception here in the Cambridge Union. Tremendous enthusiasm from all sides of the house for Mr. Baldwin, who has been listening to the arguments, now will bring the voice of actual experience to the debate. Good evening. <laughs> I, um, I find myself, not for the first time, in um, the position of a kind of Jeremiah. For example, I don't disagree with Mr. Burford that the... Um, the inequality suffered by the American Negro population of the United States has hindered the American dream. Indeed it has. I quarrel with some other things he has to say. The other deeper element of a certain awkwardness I feel has to do with, um, it has to do with one's point of view, I have to put it that way, one's, uh, one's sense of one's system of reality. It would seem to me that the proposition before the House, when I put it that way, is the American dream at the expense of the American Negro, or the American dream is at the expense of the American Negro, is a question hideously loaded, and that one's response to that question, or one's reaction to that question, has to depend on effect, an effect on where you find yourself in the world, what your sense of reality is, what your system of reality is. That is, it depends on assumptions which we hold so deeply as to be scarcely aware of them. A white South African or a Mississippi sharecropper or a Mississippi sheriff or a Frenchman driven out of Algeria all have at bottom a system of reality which compels them to, for example, in the case of the French exile from Algeria, to defend French reasons for having ruled Algeria. The Mississippi or the Alabama sheriff, who really does believe when he's facing a Negro boy or girl, that this woman, this man, this child, must be insane to attack the system to which he owes his entire identity. Of course, for such a person, the proposition of which, which we're trying to discuss here tonight does not exist. And on the other hand, I have to speak as one of the people who've been most attacked by what we must now here call the Western or the European system of reality. What white people in the world, because the white box of white supremacy, I hate to say it here, comes from Europe. That's how it got to America. Beneath then, whatever one's reaction to this proposition is, has to be the question 
of whether or not civilizations can be considered as such equal or whether one civilization has the right to overtake and subjugate and in fact to destroy another. Now what happens when that happens? Leaving aside all the physical facts which one can quote, leaving aside rape or murder, leaving aside the bloody catalog of oppression, which we are in one way too familiar with already, what this does to the subjugated, the most private, the most serious thing this does to the subjugated, is to destroy his sense of reality. It destroys, for example, his, uh, his father's authority over him. His father can no longer tell him anything because the past has disappeared. And his father has no power in the world. This means, in the case of an American Negro, born in that glittering republic, and in the moment you are born, since you don't know any better, every stick and stone and every face is white, and since you have not yet seen a mirror, you suppose that you are too. It comes as a great shock around the age of five or six or seven to discover that the flag to which you have pledged allegiance, <laughs> along with everybody else, has not pledged allegiance to you. Darkness heats light, shining so brightly, you know it's sad. Don't let them take you, don't let them take you, baby. Don't let them take your soul. Don't let the games control you, baby. Now just learn to let them go. Don't let them take you, don't let them take you, baby. Don't let them take your soul. and very pleased to be able to call Mr. William F. Buckley, Jr. to speak forth to this motion. Now we have Mr. William Buckley, who will need all his skill to establish a sentence here over his audience, which has clearly been so deeply moved Thank you, Mr. President. by the eloquence and Baldwin. personal experience of the preceding speaker. Take our Mr. Rufford, gentlemen. <clears throat> It seems to me that of all the indictments Mr. Baldwin has made of America, are here tonight and in his copious literature of protest, the one that is most striking involves, in effect, the refusal of the American community or to treat him other than as a Negro. The American community has refused to do this. The American community, almost everywhere he goes, uh, treats him with the kind of unction, uh, the kind of satisfaction uh, at posturing carefully for his flagellations of our civilization that indeed uh, quite properly uh, commands the contempt which he so eloquently showers upon us. Uh, it is impossible in my judgment uh, to deal with the indictment of Mr. Baldwin unless one is prepared to deal with him as a white man. Unless one is prepared to say to him the fact that your skin is black is utterly irrelevant to the arguments that you raise. Uh, the fact uh, that uh, you sit here as is your rhetorical device uh, and lay the entire weight of the Negro ordeal on your own shoulders uh, is irrelevant to the argument that we are here to discuss. The gravamen of Mr. Baldwin's charges Ameri of, against America are not so much that our civilization has failed him uh, and his people, that our ideals are insufficient, but that we have no ideals, that our ideals rather are some sort of a superficial coating 
uh, which we come up with at any given moment in order to justify uh, whatever commercial and noxious experiment we are engaged in. Uh, thus, uh, Mr. Baldwin can write his book, The Fire Next Time, uh, in which he threatens America. Uh, he didn't, in writing that book, speak with the British accents that he used exclusively tonight in which he threatened America with the necessity uh, for us to uh, jettison... Uh, for us to jettison our entire civilization. The only thing that the white man has that the Negro should want, he said, is power. Uh, and he is treated from coast Speaking to coast in the United to States. Mr. Buckley, uh, with a kind Mr. of Buckley doesn't choose to give away the interrupter master, in and he has done. The interrupter now sat down. goes beyond anything that was ever expected from the most, most servile Negro creature by a Southern family. I propose to pay him the honor this night of saying to him, Mr. Baldwin, I am going to speak to you without any reference whatever uh, to those uh, surrounding protections which you are used to in virtue of the fact that you are a Negro. And here we need to ask the question, what in fact shall we do about it, Mr. President? What shall we uh, in America try to do, for instance, uh, to eliminate those psychic humiliations which I join Mr. Baldwin in believing are the very worst aspects of this discrimination? Uh, you found it uh, a source of considerable mirth to laugh away the statistics of my colleague, Mr. Burford. I don't think they are insignificant. Uh, they are certainly not insignificant uh, in a world which a attaches a considerable importance uh, to material progress. Uh, it, it is, in fact, the case uh, that seven-tenths uh, seven of the white income of the United States uh, is uh, equal to the income that is made by the, uh, by the average Negro. I don't think this is an irrelevant statistic, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it takes a capitalization of uh, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen thousand dollars per job in the United States. This is a capitalization uh, that was not created uh, exclusively as a result of Negro travail. My great-grandparents worked too. Presumably yours worked also. I don't know of anything that has ever been created without the expense of something. Uh, all of you who hope for a diploma here are going to do that at the expense of a considerable amount of effort and I would thank you uh, please not to belie uh, the fact that a considerable amount of effort uh, went into the production of a system which grants a greater degree of material well-being to the American Negro uh, than that that is enjoyed by 95 percent of the other peoples of the human race but even so uh, to the extent that your withering laughter uh, suggested here that you found this a contemptible observation I agree I don't think it matters that there are 35 millionaires among the Negro community. If there were 35, if there were 20 million uh, millionaires among the Negro community of the United States, I would still agree with you that we have a dastardly situation. But I'm asking you not, uh, not to make politics as the crow flies, to use the fleeted phrase of Professor Oakeshott, but rather to consider what, in fact, is it that we Americans ought to do? What are your instructions that I'm to take back to the United States, my friend? Darkness heats light, shining so brightly, you know it's sad. Don't let them take you, don't let them take you, baby. Don't let them take your soul. Don't let the games control you, baby, now. Just learn to let them go. It's 
baby now. Come on, baby. 